These little animals are members of one of the three major clades of living echinoderms I'll cover in this video. Its focus will really be on asteroids and ophiroids, since I don't have easy access to living crinoids. There are actually five major clades of living echinoderms. I'll cover the remaining two in another video. We'll organize those five clades according to this phylogeny. Crinoids are sister taxon to the remaining living echinoderms, and those form two clades. The asteroids and ophiroids form a clade called Asterozoa, and the echinoids and holothroids form a clade called Echinoidea. Let's start with a crinoid, Antidon. This is a member of a group of crinoids called the feather stars. They hold on to solid substrates using the cluster of cirri you see on the bottom of the screen on the aboral side of the body. The oral end is facing up. The mouth is in the center of that circle of arms. Each of those arms has side branches called pinules, and the tube feet extend from those. The tube feet are sticky, and particles in the seawater get caught on them and pass down to the mouth. The water vascular system is more or less normal, except crinoids don't have an external madreporite. The stone canal just opens into the paravisceral salome. That's all I have in terms of crinoids, so let's move on to the asteroids or sea stars. Here's a familiar California species, Pateria miniata, in aboral view. This is often called the bat star. The madreporite on this individual is near the center of the disc at about 11 o'clock. The anus is in the center of the disc. Here are the anus and madreporite at higher magnification and in a different orientation. The colorful objects surrounding them are aboral ossicles covered with tissue of different colors. The anus is a little cryptic. It's a tiny hole just to the left of the center of the screen. It would have been more obvious had this animal defecated while filming, but it wasn't so indelicate as to do that. The other thing you can see on the aboral surface of this species are what look like small blisters sticking out from between the ossicles. Those are papillae, thin-walled extensions of the paravisceral salome that extend through pores in the aboral body wall. Salomic fluid circulates through these and exchanges respiratory gases with the seawater on the other side by diffusion. We'll see this a little better in the next species we look at. Here's a view of the oral surface with the mouth in the center and five ambulacri radiating out from it. If you pick up a pateria, the body wall often seems quite stiff, but it can also be very flexible. You can see this by turning one oral side up, which they do not like. They immediately try to right themselves. Here's another individual doing the same thing.
Here's a nice view of the tube feet in two ambulacri. You can see that the tube feet at the tip of each ray are much more slender than those on the oral side of the body. Those are the youngest tube feet. The tube foot at the very tip of each ray has an orange or red patch at its base. That is actually a compound eye with something like 100 omatidia in each of those eyes. So asteroids have as many compound eyes as they have rays, so usually five. Here's one of those compound eyes in a bit more detail. In addition to locomotion and vision, Pateria can use its tube feet to pass food to the mouth. I was hoping to see this individual evert its cardiac stomach over this shrimp, but that wasn't visible in this view. After 30 minutes of waiting, I removed the shrimp to see if the stomach was everted, and it was a tiny bit. One can induce pateria and other sea stars to spawn by injecting them with one methyl adenine. When they do spawn, you can see that they have a pair of gonopores in each ray pit. This is a female. When fertilized, eggs develop into bipinaria larvae. Here's an early bipinaria. And here is a later stage by Pinaria. After this stage, they add a few attachment structures called brachiolar arms at the anterior end, and they are then called brachiolaria larvae. Brachiolaria larvae are capable of metamorphosis. Here's another common Southern California species, the armored sand star, Astropectin armatus. The madreporite on this individual is really obvious. It's called a sand star because it lives in sandy habitats and is often burrowed under the sand.
Astropectin has a huge diversity of ossicle types, from spines on the edges of the rays, those massive ossicles at the margins of the rays, and a type of ossicle called paxillae covering most of the aboral surface. Here are paxillae at higher magnification. They look like little star-shaped objects covering the whole aboral surface. Like Pateria, Astropectin have papillae, but they are mostly hidden under paxillae. You can see them here looking between paxillae. They sometimes move if you poke them, which makes them easier to pick out. And you can see how they are hidden under paxillae if you look at a bit of aboral body wall in side view. Each paxilla is like a thick column with some smaller ossicles radiating out from its top. The papillae are interspersed among the paxillae. Astropectin's tube feet don't have adhesive discs at the end, they're pointed. We usually think of this as an adaptation to living in sandy habitats where there isn't much to adhere to. Tube feet and all echinoderms are part of a salomic system called the water vascular system, which contains salomic fluid. The inside of the water vascular system is ciliated, and that drives fluid within it to circulate. You can see some particles moving around in some of these tube feet in that salomic flow. You can see some more of that water vascular system in a cross section of a ray. Inside the big paravisceral salomic space, you can see the ampullae of the tube feet. 
as well as the tube feet extending to the oral surface. The tiny hole between those two tube feet is the radial canal in cross-section. There are also lots of different kinds of ossicles visible here, spines of various sorts, marginal ossicles, paxillae, and ambulacral ossicles. If you remove the aboral body wall, you can see pairs of pyloric ceci radiating out into each ray. In the center, you can see the pyloric stomach. Here's the rectum, the connection of the pyloric stomach to the anus. And here's the actual anus viewed from the interior of the animal. If you pull aside the pyloric ceci, you can clearly see ampullae of the tube feet. And in each ray pit, you see a pair of branching gonads. Each one of those is connected to a separate gonopore in that ray pit. Let's look at the connection of the madreporite to the rest of the water vascular system. Here it is on the outside of the animal. If you flip back the aboral body wall, you can see that it connects to the stone canal, which cracked as I did that. To see the rest of the water vascular system, one needs to remove the digestive system. As I did that, I got a good view of the cardiac stomach, which had been protruding from the mouth. Here's that stone canal. Those white stripes surrounding it are ossicles. The ossicles of the stone canal are easy to remove and look at at higher magnification.
At this magnification, you can see the stereome microstructure characteristic of echinoderm ossicles. The ring canal is actually covered with ossicles, so we can't see it, but we can see two structures attached to it. First are the polyan vesicles, which are sort of like ampullae for the ring canal. They are direct extensions of the water vascular system. Here are five of them. There's actually one more hidden on the other side of the stone canal. And the five dark red structures in the center of the field of view are the five Tiedemann's bodies, which is where some salomic cells are produced. And again, you can see the radial canal, ampullae, and tube feet in this cross section of a ray tip. So the two parts of the water vascular system we have not seen directly are the ring canal and the lateral canals. You can induce these to spawn just like we did with bacteria. Here's an early bipinaria larva. These do not make brachiolar arms, so the bipinaria is the only larval stage. Here's a late bipinaria with a juvenile forming at the posterior end. At metamorphosis, that juvenile sometimes eats the larval body, which is what it's doing here. And here is a recently metamorphosed juvenile. Sister taxon to the asteroids is a group called the brittle stars, or ophiaroids. We have lots of species of brittle stars in the rocky intertidal in Southern California. Here's a lovely one, Ophioderma panamens. You don't see madreporite or anus in this aboral view because brittle stars do not have an anus at all, and the madreporite is on the oral surface. To see that oral surface, you really have to anesthetize these because like sea stars, they do not like being upside down. You can see five large ossicles, called oral shields, surrounding the mouth. One, the one at seven o'clock, looks different from the rest. That is the madreporite. The openings outside of the ring of oral shields and on either side of the base of each ray are called bursal slits. Those lead into internal chambers, the bursae, which are used for gas exchange. Ophioderma was a large brittle star. Amphipholus squamata is a tiny one. The largest individuals here are adults at full size. These are extremely common in Rainbow Lagoon in Long Beach.
the bursal slits of amphipholis look a little different than those of Ophioderma. Here's another of our intertidal species, Ophionereus annulata. And here's another, Ophiopterus papillosa. And here's a beautiful suspension feeding brittle star, Gorgonocephalus. This is usually called a basket star. It's rays branch, so there appear to be many of them. They hold these rays out into the water current and capture particles on hooked spicules protruding from the rays. They have bursal slits at the bases of their rays, like other ophioroids. Here's another local ophioroid, Ophiothrix spiculata. These occasionally spawn for us in lab, so I've reared their larvae. Here's a very early Pluteus larva. It has some calcareous spicules that are giving it that triangular shape. Those spicules get longer and form arms. A later stage has several pairs of those larval arms. The arms carry a ciliary band that the larvae use for swimming and for feeding. They capture food using ciliary reversal. Here's a slightly later stage. And here's a late larva. The blob in the middle is now a juvenile ready to shed those larval arms and fall to the bottom.